I'm Sean Robertson. I'm here uh, with Chris Butler, um, who is the director of the film Scopia that is premiering at the Aberdeen International Film Festival tonight. So, Chris, welcome and thanks for uh, coming to speak to us tonight. Thanks for having me. Cool. Um, so, can you tell us what is uh, your film about, just kind of very generically? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Uh, without giving anything away, uh, um, Scopia is about a young Polish girl who lives in London and after battling with some mild depression and anxiety she starts um, seeing a psychologist uh, and they try um, an orth unorthodox method of hypnosis, uh, hypnotic regression and not only does she regress back to her traumatic troubled childhood but it kind of goes a bit wrong and she starts to regress further and further back and um, her, her previous lives start to come in. Right. And after that point it gets a bit strange and she right. starts to relive traumas and deaths from previous mm. lives and incarnations. Sounds quite freaky, so it does. Mm. Uh, was there any kind of uh, mythology or any kind of event that inspires this film? There was an event, and um, it's 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 one of those things. It's I think some some people sit with a blank piece of paper and try and come up with an idea for a film, uh, and there's the other kind of film, which is usually a writer and director, where the stuff you've had in your head for years that you kind of want to get out. And Scopia was based around themes that I've just always been into, so I always used to like watching. You know, um, alien abduction documentaries or, or reincarnation documentaries or you know uh, anything kind of supernatural and I just, I just, it's just stuff that I'm into and I, I read about it and I watch whatever's on TV late at night mm -hmm. you know it's, it's, I was a TV junkie as a kid growing up um, and stuff like that I mean, I, mean I, I grew up in Liverpool which is like football town but I didn't I didn't ever get into football mm -hmm. so me and my dad would bond through films and sci-fi and weird documentaries about werewolves and UFOs. So all those things that I've just kind of been into you know, for years and then when you get a chance to write a script, I, I mean, a completely independent film, there's no studio behind you. It's like, you know, write a script, okay, so you just think of all your favorite things yeah. and focus on that. Oh, that sounds really cool. Um, you, you remind me of myself a little bit with the sci-fi horror stuff. Um, when you were writing this one, uh, were you writing it with the intent to make it or were you just writing it because you felt a story coming along and you were like, this needs to be written? It was uh, purely with the intention of, of making it into a film. Okay. I mean, I, I, wrote, I, I wrote it as a screenplay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, I literally kind of, I, I quit my job and, right. you know, quit my flat and wow. I went to live back with my mum and all that, you know, I li mm -hmm. literally kind of walked off into the sunset and said, I'm going to make a film. Yeah. Um, I spent about two weeks putting together a first draft mm -hmm. and then from that point onwards I had enough to kind of pitch in to the producer and right. to start start planning the shoot so I mean, I mean it was you know it was written as a film mm -hmm. you know every every scene's visualized and then captured mm -hmm. on paper rather than the other way around uh, so yeah it's totally it was it was written to make into a film cool. otherwise I, I wouldn't have done it yeah no too right um, one thing I'm interested in a little bit is when you were writing with this intent to make it, did you ever think or factor in the cost of certain scenes? So did you ever have this idea for something where like, no, that's going to cost far too much and we'll maybe change it a little bit? Or I purposely um, I had a discipline where I wasn't allowed to think of budget while mm -hmm. I was conceiving ideas, or especially writing and capturing ideas and then yeah. crafting it into a script because... Well, I mean, it, it it will kind of stifle creativity and ideas, and I, I know I know from experience if have the idea first. I mean, this the kind of order it works for me is have an idea that you love, and like the idea might be a giant shark in Jaws or whatever it is. Have an idea you like, and then try and have ideas of how to make the idea. It's another when you're on a budget, it's another creative process, mm. you know. So, in in Scopia, there's a lot of scenes set in ancient Japan. Uh -huh. So obviously when I'm writing the script, I'm like, you know, exterior, ancient Japanese mountains, and there's an alarm bell on your head mm -hmm. that says, 
you know, I'm sat in my mum's house. Yeah. <laughs> I've got, I'm rifling for the bargain basket for, for dinner, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and you have to kind of silence it and say, we'll just keep writing. And then if you have to call it afterwards, if you have to take things out, so be it. Right. But have, you know, start there and then, because you've always got a sacrifice thing. Yeah. So do, do the full fat version mm-hmm. if you can. And, um, and luckily I didn't have to cut out ancient Japan. Yeah. We filmed it in Peckham. Nice. Because <laughs> it's always a way, you know, it's always a way. So. Yeah, too right. right. Um, that was, that's really interesting. Um, so once you had your uh, draft to pitch to producers, how long did the project take to get to where it is now? Okay, so from, I'd say from first draft of the script mm-hmm. to this interview, yeah. I'd say just approaching four years. I'd say, yeah, this is a big sacrifice. It is. Did you ever have moments where you were like wanting just to be done with it or were you? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I expected it to happen, mm-hmm. but when it happens, it's still, it's, it's tough. It you know? is. Yeah. Halfway through, halfway through what we knew was an ambitious script anyway, mm-hmm. you know, six, there's six time periods in it. So our department wise, it was huge mm-hmm. uh, and there's no money. It's just, it was, you know, it was, it was terrifying, especially to give things up to yeah. pursue it. And um, there, was, there, was, there was the time when we were a quarter of the way through principal photography, we ran out of money. And that was one of the moments. And then there's a time when we were halfway through, there was a time when we were three quarters way through. There was a time when we just had to do, we were trying to raise money for like the last three days filming in the film. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm close to the finish line, it's like, you know, three and a half years in production, uh, and that's just principal photography. And um, and then there's moments when you think it's not going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's like, we've run out of steam, we've run out of favours, we've pissed everyone off, <laughs> you know, it's yeah. nothing else we can get. Um, but it happens a lot, and it, it's a natural part of the process. If, mm-hmm. if it's not happening, then I think you're doing something wrong. And yeah. without that fear, then there's not as much fuel, I think. So, yeah. channel channel the fear <laughs> <laughs> no. and the worry. My my questions aren't structures. It's more of an organic style interview. But um, so to go for spending three years, three four years making a film. Have you had like a fair bit of kind of filmmaking experience in the past, like making shorts and uh, yeah, uh, kind of yeah. I did short films. Mm-hmm. I had a background. I did. I had a career in kind of the commercial advertising okay. industry. My job title was a creative. So I, I had to think of ideas. That was my job. Right. I did that for like nine years. Mm-hmm. And that was hard enough to get into as it is. You, mm-hmm. you rock up in London and start knocking on the doors of Saatchi and Saatchi and big advertising agencies saying, buy my ideas. Um, and that was tough. So then, you know, you broke, broke into advertising and um, Spent uh, yeah nine years working in that, and that's when you get to have ideas, you get to execute ideas, and it might be a TV commercial, it might be a radio ad, it might be a poster, whatever it is. <coughs> and that's great to cut your teeth for me because you're not it, it's it's um you do everything. It's almost like a foundation course for but in your career. So you're working with designers, photographers, filmmakers, mm-hmm. animators. So that was that was really good experience in terms of having an idea and. You know, executing it and yeah. having to manage people and direct them to mm. execute your vision. <coughs> but you know, writing a thirty-second TV commercial to promote toothpaste and a ninety-minute psychological <coughs> mesh or mm. sci-fi drama. So um, I think that's what I took. I knew how to have an idea uh-huh. and have to get it to match what I had in my head. Mm. That took years mm-hmm. on a tiny scale, and then when I took that into feature film, I just want to stick to that discipline. Yeah and just convey your ideas and get people on board and mm-hmm. find the right talent. You yeah. know, people like you, you, your DOP should know what you're thinking. Do you know what I mean? You need, and your actors and anyone who's going to work with you for creatively, mm-hmm. they just have to um, work at a level with you, with you, not for you. Yeah. And, and, I knew, and I knew that because I'd seen it happen. I'd, mm. I'd seen it being done wrong. All oh, right. You know, you go on sets, on commercials and stuff, and you see it being done so wrong yeah. like if I ever get to make a movie I'm going to do it different <laughs> and that's 
that's what you do. Oh, cool. So when you were getting your cast and your crew together for this one, did you already have a lot of people sort of in place from your experience doing your previous job, or did you go out with a completely sort of fresh mind looking it, for it was, it was a clean slate, mm -hmm. completely. I did, I did try it. I mean, I tried to pull in favours and people who worked in production mm -hmm. from commercial, you know, production companies and stuff. But it's what I found is it's a completely different industry. The the commercial, you know, TV commercial producer and a feature film producer will never be in the same room. It's a completely different industry. So I, at the time it was tough, but I look back now and I'm quite glad that I didn't pull in a single favor. I literally, I literally started again, and it was, it was big and scary, yeah. but not, nothing, nothing was transferable. In the end, we just had to oh, right. start again. It does sound pretty freaky, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> <laughs> it was scary. If it, if the script was scary, yeah. yeah. Uh, trying to make the film mm -hmm. it was big, dark and scary. But um, yeah, but yeah it, was, it was a clean slate. Just mm -hmm. wanted to go for it, you know. Sounds really interesting. Um, so when you um, were actually making the film, was that when you were thinking about distribution as well, like running it through all the festival circuits, or did that come after everything had wrapped filming? I think you, you, th you think of it all from the start, I mm -hmm. think. I mean, even when you write the script and I run it by the producer, you know, at, at the stage of the first draft, you're having conversations about your target audience and your, your key demographic. You know, there's the genres of film that you're going to be part of and who that's going to appeal to yeah. so you, you you're conscious of that all the time mm -hmm. but at the same time whilst it's your first completely independent feature film you're conscious of making sure you keep the creative freedom mm -hmm. that you're not going to get on the next film because on the next I mean, if, if you get if there's a studio behind a film mm -hmm. you know there's, 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 there's squads of marketeers there are focus groups and yeah. and the audience and the the studios have a big say in your script mm -hmm. and the scenes and the cast and everything like that so it's something you're aware of all the way mm -hmm. but with me I was cautious of making sure you keep the artistic integrity at yeah. the same time so are you quite happy that you've gotten to make like this independent film while it may have not been the most uh, financially rewarding but like artistically creatively rewarding you've had total freedom completely uh, absolutely it's like creative detox get it all out your system you know but 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 i think it's, it's the, that's the whole point because if you if your first feature film needs to be your calling card mm -hmm. you know just look what i can do and look what i can do with no money as well you know it's, it's <laughs> you want money more than anything at the time but you look back and you're kind of glad because you did it the hard way yeah. um but i think my, my philosophy is tr try and only do what you want to be known for and then if you, you want someone to pay you for it, then they're going to approach you based on what you like to do because that's all you've done. All right. you know, so, so yeah. really, and I think as a film director as well, you want to have a signature. Because mm -hmm. if you go to big studios or whatever and say, hey, I'm a filmmaker, I want to make the next Godzilla. And they say, well, I've got loads of directors that, you know, very, very seasoned directors that can pretty much film any kind of genre. Mm -hmm. we want, what makes you special? And you say, well, I can make a film. Yeah. They say, well whatever so i mean the ideal i think for an up and coming talent in film is to mm -hmm. is to do something a bit different yeah. or contribute something to film you know mm -hmm. and then if it goes well then the phone will ring and people will come to you because you've got something unique you need to sell yeah. it is about that sort of out of the box thinking then it is um, it is for me I, I personally i'm relieved when i see a film that tells a story in a slightly different way mm. or does something that I'm not expecting or, or whatever but I hate I personally I, half the films that I watch and I think everyone's the same you go halfway through it and you don't need to see the end because mm. you kind of yeah you get, can predict it you can predict it's happen. formulaic it's just yeah. the standard models for films that everyone follows commercially um, and there is an, a big audience out there that quite hungry for alternative films and seek it out and I think a lot of the time it's disappointing because for me I do it myself and I'll seek out something that looks different and it's going to show me new things and take me new places and I watch it and it's just it can be a pile of garbage sometimes and it's different but, <laughs> but it's crap you know and I think you know, I, I always say with Scopia if you were to get our perfect target audience and say it was you 
And in your DVD collection, I'd find uh, Mulholland Drive, and I'd find Donnie Darko, and I'd see the David Lynch films, you know? And, and yeah. that's the audience. And people yeah. like that, with me personally, I've, I'm yet to add to that collection in my DVD collection, because no one really does it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like to bring back some classic, you know? I mean, Scopey is a horror film, but it's, it's meant to be a classic horror film. Yeah. Inspired by The Shining and stuff like mm. that, you know, it's not just. A it's not one of these new gore for the sake of gore. Horror no, I mean films. it's not full of teenagers that you just, you just can't wait till they get killed, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's the, that's the formula now, you know. Yeah. And I'm so glad when they get killed because they get on my nerves. Mm. So it's none of that's allowed. I spent ages designing the film in a way so it doesn't come across like a a, a British mm. independent film, and also doesn't come across like. I don't want to say Hollywood because I like Hollywood films, but you know, this, this a girl is a victim and she has to find the strength to survive, and mm. and that could have gone in a cliche way, you know. When I was mm. casting it, I was trying to find girls that genuinely you would really feel bad for if something bad happened to them, mm. and that when they find the strength and win whatever, then you feel it and you're glad, you know. Yeah. Whereas uh, most films, they 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 cast the chick. And you just wait. You can just tell she's tough. Mm-hmm. She's just got glasses on. <laughs> <Do you know? laughs> and when she mans up and what I've saved yeah. today, she just takes her glasses off. So just trying to avoid all that stuff, you know, and make, yeah. make her something that, I mean, it gets called art house and stuff like mm-hmm. this. But to be honest, all I want is for an audience to sit and watch it and just give a damn, mm. you know, and walk out and go, wow. Yeah. That, that's all you should be aiming to do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what I like in horror films is um, not the sort of gore or the slasher moment, but that build up of the suspense. Even if like hardly anything's happening, it's just someone doing a monologue or something. But it's it really gets to you. That for me is a lot better than some dude running around with a chainsaw. So yeah. are there any moments in Scopia where you ramp up the suspense that were really fun to write? Or do you yeah, get it's good. It? I mean, it's good. You have those tools at your disposal, and if you. If you're fairly into your films, you know, you, you kind of know them all anyway. Yeah. I mean, prior to film courses and stuff like that, because you've grown up on a diet film. But, um, I mean, I'm the, I'm the same. If I see someone running around with an axe or a chainsaw, so now I'm, I'm desensitised to that yeah. since the 80s, to be honest, the 70s or the 60s, whatever. Yeah. Um, but someone can put a lot of tension into the room without not very much happening. Mm-hmm. And I, I can feel that, you know, especially with audio not, not tricks, but the audio craft mm. of in a sound, surround sound cinema. When I can, like, I can watch something like there's not much happening, but you know, the, the I always say visual fills the screen, but the sound fills the room. It's in the room mm. with you, and I can be on edge. You know, I'm dreading the next moment. Yeah. I'm a dis- I'm a bit disappointed sometimes when then nothing actually happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I need a reward yeah. for that. And um, so yeah, in in Scorpio, there's moments where. I, I play with the formula mm-hmm. because I think I think for me a good horror film you, you, you start off with the familiar language of that kind of tension for an audience and as an audience starts to feel at ease with it because it can sometimes just reassure an audience that it's just a film mm-hmm. if it's very familiar yeah. the techniques and once you've convinced them that that's what this film's going to be like then you play with it you take it away so there's, there's times in Scorpio where I I remove it on purpose mm-hmm. and then something weird does happen yeah. and I'm not expecting it. So mm-hmm. yeah, so I, I, I do it but I, I mess with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's have a little talk about the sort of festival circuits you're running. So um, how did Aberdeen come to be the sort of premier festival or was it purely by chance? It's just pure chance. I mean yeah. it's just based on festival submission dates for festival deadlines and festival screening dates so uh, this week is Aberdeen next week is the British Horror Film Festival which is in Leicester Square and then after that who knows so I mean you you kind of you just start to enter the film festivals and you just sit and wait and it's actually quite horrible because you know for the last almost four years Mm. you're like come on keep going keep going keep this thing moving you know find more strength find more money find whatever it is Mm. and then you send off your, your, your baby to all these film festivals and you sit and wait and there's nothing else you can do yeah. you can't push it or mm. you know you can't change it so um yeah it's just the order of announcements yeah no that's that's totally fair enough so um 
after all this hard uh, work, four years pushing through, are you really excited to see this premiere tonight and the audience's reaction to it? Yeah, I am. I, I've we, we've we've screened the film, we, we've tested the film and stuff like that. But this is the first time it's been, you know, job public and you know, a, a cinema. So um, I'm actually I'm just I'm looking forward to it. I think, I think the first time you show your film, you're terrified. But I've lived with the film for so long now, I'm kind of I'm kind of over it. Yeah. So I did do that when I when I, uh, the first time I did a short film, mm -hmm. and we had like a screening in London. There was about a hundred people there, and I was, I was terrified. I was like, cancel this, don't play the film. <laughs> Everyone's looking at my work on a screen, and it's it's like, you feel really exposed, you know. Especially when you write it, because all your thoughts, you know. And a horror film, your deepest, darkest thoughts. So yeah. everyone goes, "Is that you?" <laughs> uh, but no, tonight I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. Oh, Can't brilliant! Wait. Cool. Um, one of the last few questions for us camera geeks. Um, what did you shoot on? And if it was sort of like DSLR style, did that kind of help with doing it for no money? Because the stuff you can get, obviously, that camera, um, can rival the something Canon. ten times it. You know, camera. What camera to? It's um. There was no DSLR. There was it was Red Epic. Oh, that was shot. <laughs> <laughs> so no DSLR. There was, yeah. I did. I did say at the beginning no no Canons and no DSLRs yeah. because it's a it's well, we shot at like four or five K. You know the mm. film's designed for a big yeah. screen. You want to and you said about, you know, was the film, did you plan to go into the film market mm -hmm. festivals, and that's one of those things that when you budget your mm. film and you, you know, can we afford another set build or can we afford another lens yeah you know they're very conscious decisions your film's designed for you know what you want it to go on and achieve so the film could screen at any cinema yeah. around the world so yeah i mean it, it's well, i mean technically red epic i guess red epic oh interesting thing for the camera people is there was two two DOPs on Scopia, okay. and I had one one DOP for all the scenes set in the present day, the very distinct look, style, feel, organic, natural, almost documentary, film documentary type feel, um, and another DOP for all the flashbacks when we go back to different time periods. Okay. So you've got a different, a very intentional contrast. So there's there's moments when we're like, in a room a bit like this, and it's very present day and it's a little bit morbid and, and then suddenly we cut to like um, ancient India or okay. medieval England or uh, 18th century Japan mm -hmm. and it's a, that huge contrast and it was very intentional that it suddenly goes cinematic mm -hmm. when you go back in time and so it was prime lenses for the present day and anamorphic for, for flashbacks right. so yeah, that was that's, I, that, I think that's quite a cool fact <laughs> it is I, I i quite like that sort of contrast and it kind of makes the flashbacks more obvious what's actually happening as if the costumes and the setting of ancient japan wasn't obvious enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> the cast change the language changes you know, <laughs> but the lens is the same yeah um it was an it was an interesting way of doing it I, I kept a lot of duality in the film like that so two dops working on the same film it's quite it's quite a new thing not many people were that familiar with the idea mm. and people were like Oh, but what about consistency? And like, that's the whole point. I want the audience to go, oh, is this a different film? You know, it just transport you. With mm. what I like about editing is you can transport someone within a frame. You know, and the bigger the leap, the better for me. Mm -hmm. So from a room like this to ancient Japan, prime lens anamorphic. Yeah, it, it, there's more impact to it. You know, yeah. same with the music. We had um, a German classically trained film score artist, Maritz Maritz Schmidt at really talented um you know classically trained guy mm -hmm. and then we had um it's a guy called chris hayden who's he's in florence in the machine and he's into his electronic stuff and he's all edgy and modern and down with the kids and stuff like that and it was just the opposite yeah. of this other guy and they didn't i didn't let them communicate mm -hmm. but i work with them separately on different right. parts of past and present yeah. And then at the end of towards production, when we get to you know the final stage, it's like right now you guys have to get what you've done mm -hmm. to mix for our, and culminate yeah. for our crescendo at the end when it all comes together. Right. So they were terrified by that. Mm -hmm. Same with the DOPs, they were terrified the idea of, of losing consistency and losing control. Mm -hmm. So I just have faith this will be cool. Um, and again, the same with the guys doing the music. They were like, well, I need to know what he's doing. So I just <laughs> we manage you separately, and then I'll 
can ban you at the end and it might just be a mess. <laughs> but luckily they made it work and it all comes together. So Yeah, it sounds like a little bit of a risk, but I'm glad it worked out for you. You gotta take a risk, yeah, you yeah. gotta take a risk. Oh, just just no fear. Yeah. <laughs> There's yeah. no fear that you lose <laughs> you lose interest. So too right. Um okay, this will be the last thing before I let you go off because your screening's probably rather soon I'd imagine. Yeah, pretty soon. Yep. Cool. Um, some <coughs> of us are studying film, others like myself are doing marine biology, but we love film, it's our passion. So did you have sort of a background in film, like did you do that at college or uni or did you just kind of go into it via other routes um, when you did your creative work? Uh, if I, uh, I was working, the first time I did it was, I entered a competition about 10 years ago, the Super 8 camera, mm -hmm. and I just bought a Super 8 camera off eBay. And I liked it because I don't, you know, well, I was one of the people I just always wanted to make a film mm -hmm. ever since I was a kid. And that's where it started. So the Super 8 camera came. I bought the Super 8 camera. I found a, a woman who uh, on eBay had like thrown her husband out and was selling all the stuff in his shed because she hated him, like, she just openly, this is this product description. <laughs> so I bought this poor guy a Super 8 camera for like three pounds and it was awesome, it was really good. Yeah. So I got that and um, and just went and shot this weird film out on a field and me and a friend of mine. Mm. And we just loved it, it was just so much fun. Mm. And so from then onwards, um, did a few more things playing around with Super 8. Mm. I don't know if you can still do it now, but back then you could send it off to Kodak and they'd send it back and you could splice it with the knife and stuff. Oh, nice. So it was great. The first thing I did was film, technically. <laughs> I got to cut it up and sellotape it and edit That's it brilliant. hands on. Um, and I was at a job where I said, uh, they do, they were doing some incentive where like they put money towards things that you wanted to do. And I said mm. to the company, can I, can I go on a film course? And they said, okay. So they put me on this film course, which meant I got to bunk off work as well. Nice. Like once or twice a week. And that was, uh, was a part-time course at the London Film Academy. Mm. And they just, they, it was just, um, was it six months? And they kind of taught you a bit of everything and you got to be a producer, a director, like, like role-playing. And then you got to write a script and storyboard and make a film at the end of it. And it was a pile of garbage, you know, <laughs> the film at the end of it, because it, yeah. it was a course, you know, but mm -hmm. it was a have a go, you know, we shot on Super 16. Edited on Steinbeck, which I haven't seen one since, I don't mm -hmm. think. And uh, and then that was it. I was like, this is what I want to do. I want to tell stories. But the one thing I learned on the on the course, I went on other courses, and I went on like a screenwriting course and mm -hmm. just topped it up bit by bit. But the main thing I kind of learned for me was the main thing I need to know is is because I wanted I wanted to be a director. I didn't that never changed before or after the course. Right. And what I learned is I just need to know exactly what I want. Mm -hmm. that's my job as a director know exactly what I want and as long as I know that then I'm okay because everyone else will commit themselves to helping me get it and that's why it was so great on, on my, my first feature film I was probably one of the least experienced people on set because mm -hmm. if you go into a big feature film and there's a lot it's a big risk and there's a lot riding on it so you make sure you surround yourself by you know industry professionals mm. and don't don't you know just because it's your first film don't get everyone else's on their first film take mm. it seriously and make a proper movie absolutely and um and it was awesome because i just learned that a film set's one of the best places to be in the world because you've got all these people who are just trying to get your vision to come together mm. so that was my background and i mean i'm i'm romanticizing it a bit but yeah. it, it, kind of, it kind of was like that i just i'm crap at lighting i'm so <laughs> bad like f tops and T stops and whatever, and like, I need a good DOP, you know, and I need a good DOP. I'm not a cameraman, I'm oh. really not. And when I work with a, cam with, with a DOP, you know, sometimes I don't even, I won't even speak in lenses sometimes or lights. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I'll talk in like, you know, a mood and a tone yeah. and a feel and an atmosphere, and, and uh, you know, I'll use anything to express it mm -hmm. until my DOP will say, oh, I know what you mean, leave, leave it with me. And he'll come up with some looks and designs. Yeah. And I go, that's it, that's cool, let's do it, and then work. Nice. I'm honest. So, um, my biggest lesson was n knowing exactly what you want. Nice. Um, if you don't know what you want, admit it, it's okay. <laughs> uh, and just, just working with the right people. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. Has anyone else got any questions? 
can I ask one question? Yes. Um, you know, I was just um, coming back to what you were saying about having two DOPs and uh, you know, so using different lighting styles and stuff. Did you also use different um, like camera movement styles? Uh, as in, mm. like, were you? Because I, I was thinking in my head, perhaps use like a tripod for the camera scenes and then like a handheld for other scenes. Is there any sort of like a yeah. clear distinction in that manner as well? A bit of a distinction, not much. The, originally, there was an idea to do all the present day. Um, handheld and free roaming and there and to do all the most of the kind of flashbacks as locked off but I threw it away in the end because it was it was a bit restricting but if you, if you see the film you'll notice that the flashbacks are a lot more steady so there's a lot more steadiness to the flashbacks and it's a conscious it's a conscious decision but it's 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 quite subtle if you didn't know well actually the, the experts will probably spot it so so, um, but yeah, it was a it was a decision decision. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Brilliant. Any of you guys? No. Cool. Right. We will end it there. So, thank you very much for coming to speak to us. And best of luck uh, tonight and any future festivals you take it to. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Brilliant.